Hey everyone, hope you're having a good day. My name's Andy, my channel's Finding Value. Uh, today we're gonna rip through Twitter, see what people are sharing on social media, like we normally do, uh, generally related to financial, wealth building, and or commodity topics. I'll interject my financial opinions as we go through it, and let's see what people are talking about. And I'll probably dive a little bit deeper into one of these statements, questions, to give you guys a little bit more uh, hands-on experience here with uh, charting and stuff. And, and what I look at, what I do, uh, I'll explain it a little bit. So, so if you want to follow me, it's at finding underscore finance. And if you want to join our community, finding value.com where I dive deeper into these sectors, the macro, and we're going to do a little bit of this today and diving into the big picture view. Uh, and that is where I like to live the big picture view. So we still have a coupon code may day, M A Y D A Y. If you're interested, we also have a question and answer session at 5 PM mountain time today which will be Sunday. So Gary Savage, and this is the one I want to dive a little bit deeper into. Gary says, if the market tells me I'm wrong, I don't fight it. I just try to recognize it as quickly as possible and change gears. You don't make money in this business by arguing with the market when he doesn't do what you expect him or want him to do. This is a very hard lesson for novice traders to learn. To an inexperienced emotional trader, this looks like flip-flopping. That's because that is exactly what it is. The ability to flip-flop and change one's mind is critical to making money, and more importantly, not losing a lot of money. If the market does something you weren't expecting, you can stubbornly convince yourself the market is wrong, or you can adapt and change gears as fast as possible. The market is never wrong in trying to change his mind will usually cost you money. Right now, the market is telling me I may be wrong about a deeper correction, possibly into a four-year cycle low before the melt-up phase begins. We've been on the sidelines and stocks, but I'm prepared to go right back in if I think the melt-up is beginning. I've gone over the go, I've gone over in the weekend report what we're going to be looking for next uh, next week to tell us if we need to pull the trigger. I think gold and metals still have further to correct or turn sideways for multiple weeks before we are ready to pull the trigger on that sector. But if the market tells me I'm wrong, I will switch gears in the blink of an eye to take advantage of the next rally. So far, though, he is telling me I am right. So if you're one of those novice traders that are unable to adapt when the market tells you that you need a different plan, then the SMT is not for you. If you're only interested in making money and you don't care about your ego and you can check your mind if the market tells you you're wrong, then I have a lot to teach you if you're willing to learn. So that's that he's talking about the time frame and being able to flip flop. Let me tell you what I see. So this is this, I might be a little bit different than Gary. Just he he does a little bit more shorter term stuff than I do. Uh, I'm more on the longer end. Uh, and this is I'll, I'll just describe the differences and why people may have contradictory statements about certain sectors or opinions about the market. And I think a lot of it ties with different time frames. So I pulled up the S&P 500. Uh, and let me, let me zoom in on this so you guys can see it as best possible. So here's the S&P 500. Let me zoom in again. So there's the S&P 500, the big picture view of how I view things. I see commodity booms, which are consolidation periods in the markets. That's a commodity boom, commodity boom, commodity boom. And you can see that there are three distinct humps in those consolidations. One hump, two hump, three hump. One hump, two hump, three hump, breakout. One hump, two hump, and this one didn't go all the way back. It broke out right off the, the get-go on the third hump. <clears throat> and that is what I think is potentially coming. This could be, and, and again, guys, I don't know with certainty, but this is my guess. One hump, two hump. <clears throat> I'll draw it in as we go. And then that, then I think there's going to be a third hump. Uh, the, the third one can do something like this, and then it'll either go up, down a little bit, or a, a, a full consolidation. This will be the third. And I don't know what that will necessarily look like, but that's what I think is, is coming. 
and, and will play out. This year will be a commodity boom. Um, this is where commodities will be really good. Same as 2000, 98, 99. That's where we got the, the signal to buy all the way through. And same with about 1970, which is right here and all the way through. I think we're at the very similar locations to those other ones. And we can look at a little bit of the information here and I can show you why I think that. And it's important to understand the big picture view. <clears throat> so when I look at data, I look for the confluence of information. A confluence of information is the stacking of information on top of each other. So when we look at this and we say one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, this is the big picture view. I should be long commodities as long as all of the data tells me I should be long. Uh, that's the way that I do it. So I grabbed just some charts to, to share with you guys. So here's the charts here, and I'll, I'll, I'll blow them up as we go, but this is the commodity to equity ratio chart. So this is your commodity to equity ratio. You can see early 70s, late 60s, it was really low. In 1998, 99, it was also low, <clears throat> and, it, and the tech bust was in 01, 02, which occurred right here. And now we're low again uh, in 2024, and this one went to 2019. It's an older chart, but it, it gives you the big, the big picture view. Conversely, this is when stocks are cheap, is at the top here. And sometimes you'll get a, a blowdown back and then you want to buy stocks at this, this point here, this point here, somewhere in this range, uh, and then probably in this range here. It's, it's generally good spots to be looking is in this downward move of this big one, big pullback, I should say. So stocks are good. Commodities are good. And we're in, quote, a good commodity uh, time frame. How do I know that? How do I know that this is going to rotate? How do I know that, <clears throat> that commodities are good and stocks uh, could underperform? Well, we got this chart and the ratio charts telling us that commodities are good in relationship to equities. So that's a piece of information that I use. Then I look at, you know, precious metals. And precious metals also do pretty well and set the pace for commodities. Um, you can see that uh, we had a pullback in the 1920s for world gold production. And I bet you that we had a commodity boom somewhere in this range over here um, where it started to come back up again. We had another one in the 40s, another one here in 1970 and on. <clears throat> and then we had another one uh, from 2000 onward where production pulled back in world gold production. We've got that same scenario set up where Barrett Gold is forecasting a, a worldwide production decline starting in 2020, really 2020. And we've got a commodity to stock ratio that's cheap. And every single time we had these big commodity booms, we had gold go down in production uh, during it or right before it. So we have that alignment with gold as well, which is, which is good. We also have this information here. What is this? Um, at the beginning of these commodity bull markets, we generally get an inflationary impulse surge. And we see that U.S. stocks and bonds underperform. Basically, we see a rotation out of those assets uh, at the beginning of a bull market. In 1969, 1931, and 2022, we had U.S. bonds and U.S. stocks both return negative. So 2022, 69, and 1931. We also have commodities that are cheap in relationship to stocks. So if I were to go back to this and I were to X a 1931, so 1931 is like right here where we came on down. In 1969, it was basically right here at the beginning of these commodity bull markets. Uh, and then the other one was 2022, which puts us right here. So at, at the beginning of these you know, moves where bonds and stocks underperform, sorry, we've got these, these three X's and they occurred beginning of commodity bull markets in every single case. So to me, this looks like we've got a similar setup to previous bull markets in commodities. In the 1970s, which I think is going to be 
somewhat similar to what's coming. You can see what outperformed in the 1970s. This is from 70 to 1979. The outperforming class is at the top. The underperforming classes are at the bottom. And then you can kind of get a gauge uh, during these sideways consolidations of the S&P 500, what does well and uh, how they do. So stocks, yeah, stocks were okay in the beginning of the bull market. Commodities, which is late stage kind of movers, occurred. So what leads it are, are, are stocks, stocks and gold, and then commodities run it on the later stage. So gold did very well every single time. Commodities did well too. Stocks underperformed towards the end of the later stages. So did technology. And this is where I think we are located. I think we're located where we basically got the initial surge of gold. Stocks did well and tech did well. That's what's doing well right now. Then commodities turn is coming. That's a late stage uh, performer. Tech generally rolls over while commodities rip. Gold and commodities rip. Gold has been moving up. Commodities have been moving up. And we're starting to get another big move to the upside. So when you get in between these rips, so to speak, and, and really what we're, what we're charting here is the cycle. This is the real estate cycle. And I know I'm going a little bit deeper than maybe you guys maybe want to, but um, gold does well on the expansion phase of real estate, which 70, 72, and 73 occurred in. We had a rollover, which gold did very well in 74. In the recovery phase of 75 and 76 of real estate, they didn't do as well because you had low inflation. We, we oversupplied homes in, in 73, 74 in that era. We had a recession in the real estate market, which also was a recession kind of big picture view. And then the recovery phase is when tech and stocks do well. And then you go back to a late cycle again, where gold and commodities do well. This is the, the real estate cycle going through like this. The demographic is what drove this move back then. Well, it, it drives every real estate move to some degree. It's the imbalance of the demographic interacting with the real estate market. Right now, we've got a massive imbalance. We are underbuilt by like 5 million homes, depending on what data you look at. And I think whenever this does come back into cycle, you're going to have slowdowns in this little cycle too. Um, I think tech will slow down and I think gold and commodities will outperform because that's when they occur. They, 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 per, they outperform during an expansion phase of real estate. And we haven't built the homes in the quantities needed yet. We're not in the hyper supply phase and that's why inventories are so low. Affordability is slowing the market down <clears throat> in terms of building new homes. And Powell, I think, has, has basically held that there. The problem is we're probably going to get a slowdown in the market at some point because rates are going to be too high. He's going to kill the housing market to some degree through the affordability. And the inventory may never come back <clears throat> to, the, to the level that would kill the real estate market. So the real estate market will be kind of Frozen is what I'll call it. And then we'll get a slowdown in the economy, which I think is occurring. We'll get the slowdown. And what is going to occur is we'll get that slowdown. Stocks will sell off. It'll be like stocks and tech down here. These will rip and it'll rotate again. We'll get a slowdown. He'll, 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 Bring the yield curve back down. It, he'll bring yields down. Uh, the yield curve could uninvert. We get the slowdown, and then it'll it'll bring that affordability right back to all of those people wanting to buy homes, which will go into another cycle again, like the late seventies, if we are over here right now. So that's that's kind of the cycle and what I'm seeing in the markets at this time. Um, and some of the data. Not, I mean, there's so much more data, guys, that I look at than just these charts. And it all points to a commodity bull market. So going back to what Gary is talking about, and I'll just go to gold here. He's talking about the short, short term. So he's talking about this pullback that we're getting here. 
And he's trying to play, you know, the move up and the move back and then buy it at, at the low again. Uh, that's what that's what he's trying to do. The traders, to be a trader, you're taking a shorter term time frame and trying to play the short term market movements. What I'm doing is I'm saying I don't want to play the short term market movement. I want to play, and this doesn't go all the way back to the early, early 70s. I want to play the move from here to here. <clears throat> And then sell it when it comes back like there. And then I'm going to look. The stock market did well from 82. That's when the stocks went up and gold went and consolidated sideways. So I want to play the stock market from here to here. Then I want to buy gold at the bottom here in the corner here and ride it on the way up. And then sell it when it comes back down there. Then I want to buy gold again at this, this spot here. So I want to buy gold there, there. And then back in 1970 when I was there and sell it somewhere at the tops if I can get it using the analysis that I have. And then on the stock market, if I were to overlay the S&P 500, you're just going to see it do opposite. We're going to have the logarithmic here. So I play gold from here to here. I sell my gold at the top, buy stocks. I ride stocks all the way up. To my sell point here and then I rotate into gold here and then I ride gold all the way up sell gold here somewhere in that range buy stocks here and then ride stocks all the way up and then you might in 2020 is where I would have sold stocks I would have sold stocks here and bought not gold but I would have bought oil and and whatever was cheap uranium here in 2020 and then ride it all the way up and then this could still go up and consolidate. That is what I'm doing. So, you know, if, if I were to do this and just do the lines, I would own gold here and I would sell and I would own stocks here. I would sell, own gold here, sell, and then own stocks here, sell, and then own gold or whatever, whatever's next here. Uh, I probably and, and that's just showing gold and stocks and and the rides of where I would I would be buying and then my sell points and then a buy point and that's that's what I am trying to do uh, is ride that now that is a completely different viewpoint than trying to catch the small market movements that occur in the short term like sell here buy here sell here buy here though that, that it's it's too difficult or even to go further where you're trying to play the shortest term market movements like like this short term pullback i don't play those so when i when somebody asks me and and what a lot of novice investors or retail investors that maybe don't dive into the markets as deeply they view everything from the viewpoint of how I've got this zoomed in here. They they view, oh, this is great. Oh, it sucks from you know this, this sideways movement. Oh, it's great. Oh, we've got a pullback. It's the end of the world. Oh, this is amazing. Gold's the best thing since sliced bread. Oh, my God, this is the biggest pullback. Can you believe that? I can't believe I'm in this stock anymore. I don't, I don't view the markets like that. And, and I don't play the short term. And, and I think that's where people might get confused of my viewpoint and the way that I view the markets versus uh, someone else. So I play these. I try I try my best to play the big market moves. And and some and when you get in early, usually you'll get in what of what I call a dead period. A dead period is in the beginning of bull markets. They kind of don't go anywhere for a while and you get a lot of volatility here. So, yeah, in 98, we threw a, a bullish um, buy, co, uh, buy signal with the commodity to stock um, ratio. But if you were buying in 98, 99, and 2000, it didn't really go anywhere for a while. So in 98, it said, yeah, you should be buying commodities. And you bought some here, and then you got this big pullback. And everyone's going to be like, oh, my God, this person lost me money. Oh, my God, I lost money in my account. I don't know what to do. What should I do? But Everything is still good. You should be buying and buying 
and buying and buying and buying and buying and buying and buying and buying and buying and buying and buying. And you would have had an average cost of something like $280 for gold, $280. And that's your cost averaging in, buying it in that, that zone there. Then you ride it from this zone that I was putting in and ride it all the way up. And there was some really nasty pullbacks along the way, like from $1,000 all the way down to $700. It's a pretty big pullback. And if you can ride it all the way up here, you might sell it out at, you know, $1,500 bucks from $250. That's a huge move for something that is as little risk as gold. So when I, when I, when I look at like something like platinum, I mean, just to give an example, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to buy here, ride it for this, and sell it maybe over here, or tra transfer it to something else if it's of better value. I don't have to drop, ride it all the way up. I might sell it here and swap it into something else, like silver or some other uh, asset that is cheap at that time. And if this is expensive, perfect. And at that time, um, I think the actual move move would have been early you would have you would have rode it all the way up here and then maybe swapped it into silver or something like that and then silk ride silver all the way up because silver um here's silver overlaid on top of it you can see that if you had ridden this up first and then swapped it here to here and then you can ride silver all the way up so silver is more of a late stage uh runner and that's the stuff that you need to know is how do these assets work under different market conditions? And this is this is what I teach on the website. We have a three hump consolidation. Um, I started buying aggressively in 2022. I did buy a little bit in here too, and then I've been buying aggressively basically in this entire region. And I swapped a lot of metals at the bottom there for this move on up. And I think we are going to break. That's what I think. And a lot of people are saying, well, platinum, it's not going anywhere. It's not doing anything. And then they try to explain away why it's not doing stuff with a narrative. <clears throat> it's running deficits. Everything looks pretty good at this, at this time. So that's basically how I view the markets. It's a, it's a, big, it's a lot longer time frame than what I think most people view it. And I'm trying to ride the big, big move uh, in the markets. That's what I'm trying to do. So that's 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 my approach. And this isn't just all, this isn't all the information I know, guys. This is like scratching the surface. I can go way, way deep. You know, you, you can study these cycles. Um, the real estate cycle is the one that I study. And then you overlay it on top of all this stuff that basically we're going over. Uh, in, it, and, and really, it's the cycle of inflation. Uh, recession, which is disinflation and or deflation, depending on how bad it is. And then you get a disinflationary period. Uh, and then you have low inflation, low inflation, low interest rates, and then you go into another inflationary cycle and it just cycles up and down. What I'm trying to do is maximize my, my holdings for that cycle, my returns during what portion of the cycle we're in. The problem is the cycles last longer than most people's attention spans. And that's where you have to be patient. <laughs> Patience is where you make all the money. You buy low when people don't want it, which is very difficult. Because everyone's going to tell you it stinks. And then you have to wait a, a good chunk of time. You, you accumulate for a period of time. It could be a couple of years. Uh, it could even be four or five years uh, at, at the most. And then you get the big move. And the big move is where you make all the money. And, and that is where I think people, they get scared because they don't know these cycles. Uh, their time frames are too short. And the shorter the time frame, you're working off of the market sentiment more so in psychology. Uh, it's less about fundamentals. Uh, companies only release earnings once a quarter. So each quarter, you get a glimpse of kind of how that company is doing. And then you can listen to the calls and, and how they're doing uh, and the CEO's opinions and stuff like that. But I, I would say the majority of people have too short of time frames. 
And the majority of people don't hold long enough. And that's why they don't make a lot of money. That's it, that's it right there. Um, I can teach you all this stuff <clears throat> on, on what looks good, what are good setups, um, technical chart pattern wise, uh, where we are in the cycle, all that stuff. But it still requires someone to hold. So that's what I've got for today, guys. And um, I'll end it there. Give me a thumb up for the content, subscribe to the channel, and we'll catch you next time. This is Finding Value.